Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Appreciate you being here in the auditorium today of the Northside Baptist Church. We welcome every one of you. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in. The Northside Baptist Church is coming to you from the auditorium. And this hour coming up, we hope to be a real inspiration to you. And you in the radio listening audience, if you get on that phone and call a friend, have them to tune in. I do believe we could be a blessing to them. So we appreciate you tuning in. Good to see every one of you. Good to see uh, Sister Helen Moon back in the service today after she paid a visit through the hospital and out. And we're glad she's back today. And good to see every one of you. And may the good Lord bless you. 1948. Dr. Edwards went on radio, and we appreciate it as the Northside Baptist Church. The adult Sunday school class took upon themselves as a part and the thrust of the Northside Baptist Church. And today, Preacher Edwards, we present this plaque to you. It says, the Northside Baptist Church recognizes Dr. Virgil Edwards for 39 consecutive years of daily radio broadcast. Thank you, Tony, and God bless you, and I, I appreciate it. I really do. I don't deserve it, but this is beautiful, and I appreciate everyone. And I'll be placing out there in my study. Northside Baptist Church recognizes Dr. Virgil Edwards for 39 consecutive years of daily broadcasting, radio broadcasting. That's beautiful, isn't it? I appreciate that so very much. Maybe one of these days when I get old enough and ugly enough, almost ugly enough now, I might Get a picture put up out there in the vestibule. That'd be fine, wouldn't it? All right, we appreciate this so very much, and God bless you. Tony's pretty good at making up tales about this Bible business, isn't he? We're going to have to promote him. He's a good tale teller. And, uh, but I do stick with the old King James Version, no doubt about that. The uh, King James Version, 1911 edition. Schofield reference, that's the best. I got about seven, eight in my study. Save people a little on them whenever they want them. Now, if you're not getting the daily broadcast, tune in each day at 12 o'clock noon. Get the daily broadcast at 12 noon, and then, of course, from 11 to 12 on Sunday. I'm going to speak today about the donkey Jesus rode into town, and the cassette tape will be tape number 294. Tape number 294, you turn to Matthew chapter 21. Now, if some of you heard me when I first went on the air in 1948, if you heard me then, write and tell me about it. I wonder how many people out there in the radio listening audience heard me when I first went on the air. Now, since that time, I've had some three people. Now, I hope I'm not overlooking anyone had some three of uh, family, the three people that helped support me on the radio, maybe a dollar a week or whatever, maybe more. And that family was the Trixie and Patsy, used to be Williams, Trixie Cooper, Richard Cooper's wife and Richard. Uh, they supported me all these years. And then the Walt and Thelma Thomaston, my wife's sister and her husband is supported me all these years, and then a Essie Bullock back there has supported me all these years. You know, when we started out, I got people to pledge to give a dollar a week to help take care of radio time, and at that time, the number of them did, and that helped keep me on the air, and since that time, God's moved upon the hearts of individuals to help me. Some help for a while, and then maybe go on to be with the Lord or something happens, and uh, then other God will speak to someone else to help pick up the tab. And we pay our bill every Monday morning. I refuse to go in debt to the radio station. And for 39 years, I've paid my radio bill every Monday, except in a way maybe on a meeting or something and couldn't get there to pay it. And I'd get, that, get down there and pay it as early as I could and I got back. I don't go in debt for radio time. If the money comes in to pay for it well and good. If not, I pay the rest of it myself. If a little more than enough come in, I save it for the next week. We have other expense other than paying the radio station. We have uh, 
uh, tape expense, buying tapes, and we have, of course, envelope stamps, gas bill, and whatnot, all involved in our radio expense in the ministry. And if God lays up on anyone's heart to stand by this broadcast, I believe when they come to the judgment seat of Christ, they're going to see a lot of good that's done through their help in this radio ministry. And if I've left anyone out that's been helping me for 39 years, overlooked you, I'm sorry, we'd, we'd correct it if I have. But these three different families I do remember very well from the first day that I went on the air. Some came in later, of course. Some came in, some dropped out. Now, these tape are $3 each, and this is tape number 294 of the donkey Jesus rode into town. I hope that you'll get this tape. The announcer give you my mailing address when I go off there. Now, each year, there's been a few, some two or three, that's given me $39, I mean, a dollar for each year that I've been on the air, which would be 39 this year. If God should lay upon your heart to do that, that helped defray some of our radio expense. And tomorrow, we'll complete 39 years of daily broadcasting from Athens. I went on the air on the first day of September in 1948. God's kept me on since that time through his people. I thank God for the open door, the opportunity. There's people in heaven today because of this ministry. That churches has been established because of it. There's missionaries on the field because of it. And there's preachers in the ministry because of it. And there's multitudes that's been blessed because of this ministry. A lot of people tell me, Preach Edwards, your broadcast was a great blessing to my mother and dad in their last days during the sunset of time when they're disabled to go to church. They listen to your ministry. And I appreciate that so very, very much. It is an open door and a home mission work. And my mailing address is Post Office Box 501, Athens, Georgia, uh, 30603. And if you write to me, let me hear from you. If you heard the broadcast when it first went on, let me hear from you. God lays on your heart to stand by. Uh, let me hear from you. And uh, I'd like to, uh, you to pray for me especially and write to me. Now in the book of Matthew chapter 21, and when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethany under the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, said unto them, Go unto the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ice tied, and a coat with her, loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughters of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, unto thee meek and sitting up on ice, and a coat the foal of an ice. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ice and the coat, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way, others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitude that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, the son of David, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come unto Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Now, if you notice here that he mentioned a donkey that Jesus used. I'm using that as a subject. The donkey, Jesus rode to town. We often find man compared to animals in the scriptures. For instance, he's compared to a sow for uncleanness in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22. Secondly, he is compared to sheep for one for stupidity in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6. He is compared as a, to a dog as an object of contempt. You find that in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 26. He is compared to an ass for his wildness and willfulness. You find that in Job chapter 11 and verse 12. So I want us to notice how this donkey here is compared to an individual in what took place. And if you look into this and see the spiritual phase of it, it can be a blessing to you. Now as a donkey was tied in verse 2, so the sinner is under the bondage of sin. People out there in sin today indulge in all kinds of sinful activities because they are bound 
and in bondage to this sin like this donkey was tied here to a post or wherever it was tied. It says in verse 2, Go in the village over against you, and straightway she will find an ass tied and a coat with her. Loose them and bring them to me. They were tied. They could not get a loose unless someone loosed them. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 22, But the scripture hath concluded all unto sin, that the prophecy by faith of Jesus Christ be given to them that believe. And so God must loose that sinner, must untie that sinner from the shackles of sin. He can't do it himself necessarily. God has to break it and God will do that and loose him and let him go. That's what happened here. Number two, as the coat was without, not in a comfortable stable, so the sinner is without. Now this coat was not found in a nice comfortable stable. He was without, tied on the outside. And that's a picture of a lost man out of the commonwealth of Israel. The Bible tells us that he's on the outside of Christ. And Mark chapter 11 and verse 4, And they went their way and found the coat tied by the door without in a place where two ways met. And so the coat was on the outside. So is every lost person today. He's on the outside of Christ. He's not in Christ. He's not in the true church. He's on the outside. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, been aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. God pictures here the Gentiles, which is a type of sinner, of course, and he says they're on the outside, and that's where they are today. Every unsaved person is out of Christ, on the outside of Christ, lost, and on the road to hell. Number three... As the coat was in a place where two ways met, so is a sinner where two paths found in this life, which is the broad and the narrow way. The Bible says that sinner is there where the two ways meet. In Mark chapter 11 and verse 4, And they went their way and found the coat tied with the door, without in a place where two ways met. And so it is with that sinner today. Now he can get saved go down the narrow road, or he can remain lost and continue down the broad road. He's got to travel one or other of these roads. He cannot travel both at the same time. He's either going down the broad, slippery road toward hell or the straight and narrow road that leads to heaven. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, he says, Enter you in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereof, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which lead unto life, and few there be that find it. So there's two ways. You're either in the narrow way or you're on the broad way. You cannot be neutral. You cannot straddle the fence. You're going down the road to hell or you're on the narrow road leads to heaven. On one of those roads you are today and you need to know where you stand. And we need to realize that you can't travel both at the same time. Number four, as the coat had never been ridden on, therefore had been of no use. So the sinner is useless to God. No man had ever ridden on the coat. The Bible says in Mark chapter 11 and verse 2, and said to them, Go your way in the village over against you, and as soon as you enter into it, you shall find a coat tied whereupon never man sat. No man had ever ridden on this coat. No man had ever ridden on this coat. Now you remember that. And so in Romans chapter 8 and verse 8, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And so a sinner cannot be used of God. He cannot please God in the flesh. As the coat had never been ridden, the sinner cannot please God until he comes to know the Lord. And you must keep that in mind. A lot of sinners say, well, I'll give a certain amount, or I'll do a good deed, I'll, I'll contribute to a religious cause, and I'll do this and that in a religious way, and, and that will help me and please God. No, it won't. No man can please God rejecting his son, Jesus Christ. I don't care what you do, how far you go, what kind of sacrifice you make, as long as you reject Jesus Christ, you cannot please God. The Bible plainly tells us that. Then number five, as a coat was known by Christ and where it was to be found, so are we. So is that sinner. God knows where every sinner is. God knows where we are. 
And God knew where the, these, the coat was. The Bible tells us in Mark chapter 11 and verse 2, he said, Go your way in the village over against you, and as soon as you enter into it, you shall find a coat tied. Now, Jesus knew exactly where this animal had been tied. Now, he was quite away from this particular spot, but Jesus knew where he was, and Jesus knows where you are. Some of you sitting out there in the radio listening audience, while well, God knows where you are, he knew, he knew what you did last night, he knows how you feel today. He knows why that you're not in God's house. He knows why you're not concerned about spiritual things. God knows that. You don't hide anything from God. God knows exactly where you are. So you must keep that in mind. God knew where this coat was tied, and he sent these men to get the coat. The Bible tells us here. Then we come to thought number six. As the coat was loosed by power outside of itself, so the grace of God is the only power that can free us from the consequences and control of sin. Now, this coat had to be loosed by a power outside of itself. Now, this coat could not untie that knot and get away from that post where it was tied. It had to have the help of another. Now, you'd be surprised today at poor lost sinners. They think they can help God save them. They think they can do certain things or must do certain things. And order to be saved, must give up this, must give up that, must make restitution before God saves them. But that's not it. God says, just like you are, come just like you are, a poor lost sinner, and accept Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. That's what God wants you to do. Come just as you are. You can't help God out. I've talked with people that said to Preacher Edwards, uh, whenever I uh, get straightened out and I get this in order and get my ducks in a row, then I'm coming to know God. Now, the devil will tell you you got to do certain things, but that's not true. God wants you exactly like you are. In Matthew chapter 21 and verse 2, Jesus said, Loose them and bring them to me. I want them just like they are. Never man's ridden on that coat. Don't mind that. You just loose them and you bring them to me. Now, that's what God wants to do for the lost today. God wants to bring you to himself. God wants to loosen you from wherever you're tied. And God will do that. He can break that shackle. He can break you from that chain of sin. God can deliver and God can rescue you. I don't care how far you've gone in sin. God wants you to get saved and you can get saved. And Jesus said, loose him and bring him in. And so as God speaks to your heart as a lost sinner, well, you ought to say, Lord, here I am as a sinner. Be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me for Jesus' sake. That's all you need to do. You don't need to straighten up anything. So many people have said, well, a preacher, when I think I can live it, then I'm coming to God. That's one of the biggest lies the devil ever told you. That is that you can't live it. You've got to feel like you can't live it before you get saved. How can you feel something you don't have? You go sit down at the table unless you taste the food. You wouldn't know how it tastes. And so unless you come to know Jesus, you don't know whether or not you live for God. But when you come to know Jesus, then you have some help. As long as Satan tells you that you can't live it and you believe that, he'll damn your soul in hell. There's multitudes in hell today that believed that and waited too late. Now when you come to know Jesus Christ... You have some help. He comes in and he keeps you by his power and he gives you strength to live for him. Well, when I got saved, I so loved the world and I was so ensnared and entangled and tied to the world. I thought I couldn't give up the world. I mean, you're talking about a person that loved the world. I loved it and everything in it. And I thought, well, I, I can't give it up. I can't give up my, my sinful life and, and be saved. I just couldn't make it. But I found out different when God came in and began to live in me, then God did it. God helped me to do what I should have done, and he'll do the same for you. I never went to church before God saved me, maybe occasionally. Uh, but when God saved me, that's the place I wanted to go, and I started going and haven't stopped yet. That's been 40-some-odd years ago. Beloved, God can save you and put that desire in you to want to go to the house of God, 
to want to read your Bible, want to pray, want to witness, and to be with God's people. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 5, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. See, like that coat tied, it couldn't get a loose. It was no good, had not doing any good. It was tied, but whenever they broke the coat loose and brought it to Jesus, then it could be used, and it was used. And so God will do the same. By his grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. What could that coat do to get away from that post? Nothing. It couldn't. It was tied. It was on the outside of the stable. Dad couldn't move, couldn't get away. And whenever they untied the coat, then that put him in a different situation. And so you're tied in your sins. You think you can't give up that beer, that wine, and that liquor, and, and the wild, rough life. You think you can't give it up. Are you going ahead and going to hell because the devil tells you that lie? You come to know God, and God will help you to overcome the world. The Bible said, he that's within you is greater than he that's in the world. And if God is in you, then God can help you to overcome the world. And he will if you want to overcome the world. There's no Christian, the Bible says, take with such temptation, but God will make a way of escape for you that you might be able to bear it. God will never allow the devil to put more on you than you can bear. God's grace is sufficient, and you can't overcome. Then number seven, as a coat was brought to Christ, so the Holy Spirit is the power that leads us to the Lamb of God who taketh away our sins. Now, whenever these people that went to get the disciples that went to untie this coat, and there they untied it and they led that coat to Jesus. Now, that's exactly what the Spirit of God does. The Spirit of God will break you loose and lead you to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says no man can come in the Father except by me. And the Bible says that God draws us by his spirit. And God speaks to that sinner and draws that sinner to himself. Just like these two disciples leading the coat to Jesus. Bringing him to Jesus. The Holy Spirit brings that sinner to God. And you'll never be saved unless the high sheriff of heaven arrests you who is the Holy Spirit. And when he arrests you and lets you know that you're a sinner going to hell, you've broken the law of God, and then he brings you to Jesus. You're brought under conviction. You're disturbed. You know you need to get saved. And it's the Spirit of God using the word to do that. In Matthew chapter 21 and verse 7, And they brought the ice and the coat and put on them their clothes and set him thereon. And so they led the coat to Jesus. In Acts chapter 26 and verse 18, Jesus came to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins, and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith, that is, in me, in Jesus. So you see then that Jesus Christ came that he might break us loose and bring us to himself through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he does that. Unless he does that, people don't get saved. This little easy believism today without any conviction or any knowledge of what you're doing is not worth a dime with a hole in it. Before a person can get saved, he needs to realize he's lost. He needs to realize he needs the Savior. And he's willing to accept Jesus Christ as his Savior. Until he comes to that place, he'll never be saved. Then thought number eight is, as the coat was used by Christ... So those who are brought to Christ are used by him. In Matthew chapter 21 and verse 7, And they set him thereon. When they brought this coat to Jesus, they took Jesus and set him upon the coat. Now the coat could be used because the Lord is with him now, and the Lord is sitting upon him and going to ride him to town. This is the coat Jesus rode to town. And now he can be used of the Lord. And he was used to the Lord, and Jesus rode him into Jerusalem. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 29, Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his work, and which worketh in me mightily. The Bible said you serve God, you labor for God, as God works in you mightily. It is it God that worketh in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. The Bible says work out your own salvation. After you're saved, then you start working for God. A man go plants a garden, and the garden comes up. There you have the, 
the, the produce in the garden of the plants, and the man goes and works that garden out that he might produce a good crop of vegetables or whatnot. So God said, work out your own salvation, but you got to have salvation in you before you can work it out. That is when you get saved, get busy for God, start serving God, clean up your life, live right, do right, and honor God. That's what he's talking about. Now they brought this man to Jesus, or this coat rather, and he sat down upon the coat and rode into town according to the Bible. Then number nine, as the coat was needed by Christ, so he needs all the people to carry out his purpose. He's the head and he's molding the body and he needs members of the body. A head needs members of the body, needs arms, legs, whatnot. And so Jesus is the head and each time a person is saved, he's placed in that body. And somewhere in that body, God has placed you as a Christian. In Matthew chapter 21 and verse 3, said the Lord has need of them. So God can use a person that wants to be used. You're born into God's family with certain gifts. All you need to do is surrender to God and find out what they are. You don't come behind any gift. God gives you these gifts. Some of them are natural. You have them whenever you're saved and they're natural gifts. And God uses them to his glory. That's a good singer. He's a real good singer, or she, and, and there they sing, and they get saved then, and they use that natural gift to the glory of God. There are those that play their instruments, and they have the ability to play their instrument. Then they get saved, and they use that to the glory of God. Some people have natural ability to do things and could be used of God if they'd come to know the Lord and want God to show them what to do and how to do and surrender to God, they can use that talent. The Bible says here, the Lord hath need of them. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you will find there that God speaks of the body of Christ, the head, the hands, the feet, the eyes, the nose. He speaks of the body. And God today is building a body. He's the head. He's in heaven and the body is on the earth. And being built, that is part of it, at least. Part of it's done gone on to be with the Lord. And you're in the paradise of God. But God is building this body. And each time a person is saved, God puts him in that body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. By one spirit, you're baptized into the body of Christ. You don't know what part of the body you're in. Some fellow said he knew where he was in the body. He said he was a coin on the little toe. Every time he moved around, somebody stepped on it. Well, you may feel that way about it, but you know where you are in that body. You may be part of the arm, part of the hand, part of the thigh, part of the foot. You know where you are, but God put you in that body where he wanted you. And you're exactly where God wanted you to build a body. God is building a body. And God is the one that puts you in that body. Now, this little old coat, it, it was no good, seemingly. Nobody ever ridden the thing. And they brought it to Jesus, and Jesus used it. A little old animal never been ridden. Usually they're wild and they'll buck and throw you off. But when Jesus sat down on this coat, he was calm as a little lamb. Why? He had God on his back. That's why. And God can calm you down and make something out of you. You feel like, well, preacher Edwards, I've been mean as the devil, ungodly. Nobody cares for me. My home is about broken up, and I've been living for the devil, throwing away my money, drinking liquor, being wine, gambling, cussing, shooting pool, living like the devil. I, I, you might say, well, I'm nothing much. Well, you may not be much, but God can make something out of you. No sin amounts to very much in this world until it really comes to know God, spiritually speaking. God can take the sorest man that walks in shoe leather and make something out of him. He'll make a saint out of him and then uh, patch him up and use him and make him over. God knows how to do that. Most people have a mountain thing for God. Wasn't much before God saved him in the first place. But when he got saved, they became somebody. And you remember the body of Christ. Now you need to realize that. This little coat didn't do much until he came to Jesus. Nobody ever ridden him. And probably no good for anything much. And Jesus knew that. And had him brought in and, and they sat down on his back and rode him into Jerusalem to fulfill Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. Zechariah, the old prophet of God in chapter 9 verse 9 said Jesus would do that. And he did exactly that. God can use you. I don't care who you are, how uh, handicapped you may be. 
Some 50 years ago, I'm not 50 years ago, but many years ago, I was 50 miles north of New York City. That's where the number 50 fits in. 50 miles north of New York City in a revival meeting. The pastor said, Preacher, I want to take you a, a, a place today I want you to see. I said, Fine. We got in his automobile and we rode over in the country to a little old Methodist church, just a little small Methodist church, and we went in. He said, you see that organ right there? I said, yes, an old-fashioned organ. He said, that's an organ that Fanny Crosby used to play. She was a member of this church, that blind girl. And he said she sat on that organ and played that organ for years. Now, Fanny Crosby was blinded from a child. Some doctor thought he could help her and she had a so eyes or some problem. He stuck some medication in her eyes that blinded her for life. Completely blind. Back in those days, didn't know much about how to treat things or whatever trouble was. And this doctor had thought he knew it all and blinded her for life. And she was just a little child when her, she lost her eyesight. But she was faithful and served God and was used of God and traveled all over this nation and and to London and other places singing for God, writing music, and blind, but she was used of God. And I looked at that organ, and I sat down on that stool, and I thought about Fanny Crosby and the great hymns that she's written. Look in your songbook sometime. See some of the greatest hymns ever written, written by Fanny Crosby. Now, because she was blind, she didn't give up. See, God used her mightily. Great will be her reward in heaven all her life. Until she's an old lady, she's used of God and travel for Jesus. And God can use you. God uses this old coat. And God can use you if you let him. Let's stand to our feet. Dear Father in heaven, with thanksgiving and praise and adoration, we're so glad that you can use human beings. God, if you can use a barnyard rooster like you did on one occasion, if you can use a donkey like you did when Balaam rode in, if you can use a coat here like Jesus rode on, if you can use animals and fowls and fish, God, we know you can use human beings. And Lord, there's not a person out here in this audience, in the radio listening audience, but you can't use if they're willing to be used. And I pray you speak to hearts in Christ's name. Amen.